characters stand inside. We're actually doing Lord of the Rings. Directors and tiny houses, tiny houses. Houses, remodeling houses. Um, basically. It's not a rather Something that other people call you. I don't call myself as, a cover. As everyone. I am Atesh Sharma, senior editor at Home Crux Magazine. We've been covering design, architecture, and production design for over past 10 years and have interviewed many eminent personalities, including the likes of Pritzer Prize director, Salon Del Mobile president, London Design Festival director, and multiple Oscar-winning production designers with the likes of Grant Major, Donald Burt, Paul D. Osterberry, Dan Henna, and uh, many others that I'm not able to recall at the moment. At, it is indeed a great pleasure to have you with Home Crux today. How's the weather in Australia? Uh, today is uh, rather miserable. It was, uh, it was 40 degrees yesterday and quite hot, and we were filming on the water. But uh, we were lucky to end the day inside an air-conditioned building, so the crew were uh, relaxed. But today we were location surveying for new new locations and it's uh gray and raining and miserable but at least it's not too warm it's chilly over here it's super chilly i'm based in india and i'm based uh in shimla which is a mountainous region it is surrounded by himalaya so it's super chilly here oh, are you in the north yeah i'm in the north you've been to india before oh yeah all how, right. could I, how could I design anything if I hadn't ever been to the cradle of civilization? Oh, wonderful. That's great to hear that. So I'd, I'd begin things with your childhood. How was your childhood like? Were you always design oriented? What pulled you toward this art form? And when and where were you born, most importantly? Okay, well, when was uh, 1956? Uh, where was Australia? Uh, and then that started a... Uh, a peripatetic and nomadic existence. Uh, we moved fairly regularly. I usually went to uh, two, usually three schools a year in different places, mostly because uh, my, my beloved father was uh, either running from the police or in jail. And uh, when he was in jail, at least we stayed in one spot for a little while. And what was the reason behind it? Uh, the same, uh, he had the same habits I do of, uh, of lying and fraud. Uh, unfortunately, he was in used car selling, and I can put my talents for lying and fraud to much better use in film. Can you share some insight into your journey and evolution as a production designer? How did it all begin? Uh, well, I guess before I was a production designer, I was, uh, I was, uh, what was I? Let me see. I guess I was a failed actor. Uh, I was uh, surviving quite well, mostly doing theatre as an actor. Uh, but uh, then I, I got married, I had children, and they began to scream for sandwiches and school and things to put on their feet, little bastards. And so uh, I had to find uh, something slightly more lucrative and regular. Uh, most of the theatre shows and things that I'd done, I'd always ended up taking over some part of the production, either lighting or uh, building the sets, painting scenic backgrounds. I, mean, I like to do everything, unfortunately. I don't do any of it very well, but I do a lot of it. So uh, having, uh, having passed acting, what it did give me was a way of looking at story. Uh, every actor knows, you know, you try to think about where you were the moment before and where you're going to be the moment after and what built your character and how far back. And uh, now I have the unfortunate uh, condemnation to have to do that, not just for the performers, but also for inanimate objects, architecture, background, even the color of the world uh, as we change it. So it's it's really just trying to have a holistic idea of uh, of how all the parts come together. And how did you get your first break as a production designer? Um, as a production, well, I was a standby props guy for uh, for a very long time. But I was a very annoying one because I tried to tell everybody else how to do their job. So they uh, they asked me to stop being a props guy and stop annoying the actors. And it was safer to park me just to one side. Uh, and also being a fat old white guy, I got uh, I got sick of taking orders from fat old white guys. And so I thought I'd better just do it myself. 
I was fortunate enough, uh, a lot of the people that I had worked with as a props or art director, um, there, there's some great talent there and uh, they were lucky. I was lucky enough for them to uh, nurture me and sort of push me along. Look at me, uh, look at me with fondness and uh, give me a, give me a chance. Uh, sort of the same way most people look at odd things like uh, watching a monkey ride a bicycle. You, you're quite a blunt guy filled with a lot of sarcasm and uh, how do people react to you when they're actually talking to you for the first time? Uh, well, you're doing quite well. You haven't left the room yet. Uh, but you'll notice on my CV, it uh, it does cut down the number of American jobs I can do because uh, sarcasm and irony are not their strong suit. <laughs> well, you're firing shots at the moment. When you're, suppose if you're writing your autobiography or when your tale will be penned down in the history of production design, if there'll be one named, they'll be associated with you, it will be George Miller. How has your relationship with George Miller, Miller evolved over the years? I mean, every time he's making a movie, he ensures to bring you in as a production designer. Well, to correct you, not, not every time. Um, I was fortunate enough, I did uh, art direct a number of jobs and Kennedy Miller, when I first started working with them, uh, had uh, recently become a production house as well as George's, you know, personal production company. Uh, and so there was quite a lot of other jobs, television series, things like that, that we could all wet our teeth on. And uh, I was just fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time as uh, as things came through. I was lucky enough not to be around when uh, Justice League was going to be his next show. I was on a, another film in Queensland. Uh, but by the time I came back and uh, George's connection to that film uh, changed, uh, he was then interested in making Mad Max. And uh, I don't know if you know, but Fury Road had a long and checkered career. So uh, yes. around about the year 2000, uh, we began to talk about doing it. And George showed me the storyboards. I think uh, I think he had planned that right from 1987. And it was in a lot of uh, production dismantling. It didn't start. And there were a lot of things going on. But he had that yeah, idea no, there, from 1987. There were there were many there were many things like your mountainous area. There were uh, there were mountains to get over and climb. And uh, uh, basically, yeah, it got it got pushed. Um, I was lucky enough because I was there and there wasn't enough money to start that uh, I was a cheap option to travel the world looking for good deserts to be the background for the end of the world. So. Uh, I like where possible to do my own location surveying and try to at least get the bones of the world that we need at the beginning and then uh, uh, and then have somewhere solid as a base to work out from. So in a way, I was I was fortunate both that production problems with uh, with money, with countries, with uh, even the uh, invasion of Iraq that put us but that put the show back. I was in Africa in 2002. And we were actually building. I was on a bulldozer putting a road in the sand dunes when uh, when uh, they invaded Iraq and uh, everybody pulled the plug on overseas production. Uh, and then eventually came back, had uh, many other th things to do. But when we restarted uh, and we're going to do it in Australia, we had two, two uh, full seasons of heavy rain and the desert bloomed like a flower garden and you were... Uh, you couldn't swing the camera in any direction without seeing camels uh, making love and uh, birds flying. So uh, we got the chance to go back to my first love for the show, my uh, favorite area, and uh, shot it indeed in uh, Namibia and uh, South Africa. Like I said, Miller envisioned the Mad Max Fury Road product in 1987, and it took him almost 30 years to make and release the movie. But during this time, he asked you to carry on making those uh, gas guzzlers and the craziest vehicles and the props, including the flame swing guitar. During this whole time, you know, how do you ensure that? Uh, how do you ensure that you put your trust on a director and you also move on that path? And how, how does it all happen? Because you also have bellies to feed to, and how do you 
and show that you are also simultaneously working on other projects other than designing cars for this particular man? Yeah, well, it, it wasn't exactly from uh, 87 and on. As I said, I, I joined in 2000. We preset locations and uh, began to talk about the tribal Bible, who the, who the characters, who the tribes, what the areas might divide up into, how we could uh, give a discernible ethos and uh, aesthetic to that, to, uh, to our apocalyptic uh, dystopia. But uh, there were other, you know, many other jobs in between. And George uh, uh, also was doing Happy Feet. So I had some small part in Tap Dancing Penguins. Uh, we were also doing the Babe movies, uh, Talking Pigs, took up a fair bit of time. Uh, we came back and uh, it was probably two solid years of working on 120, 130 vehicles for Fury Road and then all the, the props and the, the weaponry, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you put your faith, if you have to put your faith in anyone, and I'm probably uh, as atheistic a human as you're likely to find, uh, George is a pretty good bet. Uh, he, has a, he has a great vision. And uh, and he uh, he hangs on to it uh, tightly. Personally speaking, there are two production designers I always wanted to talk to. One being Alex McDowell. I don't know if you know him or not. He's a UK-based designer. The guy who designed the sets of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And I wanted to interview him because, you know, he left an imprint in my heart. And the other was you, Colin. And the reason being, obviously, Mad Max Fury Road, which introduced me to a worlds that was crazy to even envision of and you went on to you know design you went on to play a very crucial role when it comes to design in designing a visually stunning post-apocalyptic world how do you approach design to ensure it felt both familiar with the existing Mad Max universe and also has a unique element of its own well I think we basically you just set up a set of rules Sadly, Atish, I think uh, I think the world's coming up with its own dystopia now, and uh, those rules are falling into place all around us. And uh, people are beginning to choose teams for the last big uh, fight in the playground. But uh, for us, we did exactly the same. We uh, we decided that uh, there were tribal groups who would therefore have varied tribal aspirations. They would also come from specific environments within that harsh wasteland, which would tailor make the direction that they would take. If they're uh, working up in high, rocky, dead chasms, then uh, they're beginning to work on trail and trial bikes. Uh, their the suspension becomes the most important thing. Uh, the clutch is king. Uh, if they're out on the middle of the desert in an oil field and uh, you need to see 150 kilometers, then you climb up a 30 foot pole and then you learn to take that pole with you and to dance on it for attack and leaving. So each of the environments, each of the, the nurture and the nature that we gave to each of those tribes gave us a chance to give them a, an intelligible, logical and uh, believable backstory. And then we, uh, we basically built everything for them from actual objects, from, from things hopefully that the world would recognize I've always figured that uh, as opposed to chat GPT or uh, any other of the AI wonderment that we're going to, we have the great uh, benefit of, uh, of looking at things from a strange angle. And that's really the production designer's job, I think, is, is to plant your feet firmly in a completely different and obtuse angle on which to look at the world and then to grow it again from that position. And uh, people still recognize things then, but they also have enough discomfort in the variation for it to hold them up and to give them a, a new sense of the old. Since you brought Chad GPT into the conversation, I'd like to ask you this. Is there a sense of fear in production designers or in you when it comes to AI taking away the jobs of designers? I, I gave a seminar about uh, three months ago at the Australian Film and Television School on just this, uh, because many of the design students uh, there were concerned that the, they were being trained for something that uh, 
that chat GPT could do as well. And uh, I had to point out that as far as I'm concerned, I've been chat GPT since I was, uh, since I began doing this sort of work, that uh, I have the advantage of, uh, of a broken home and uh, some failed relationships, loves that worked and loves that didn't. And uh, no algorithm is going to tap into that empathy and uh, design is tapping into that empathy. Design is just a visual poetry. And uh, yes, they can put all the right words together and they can put them and make them rhyme, but I'm, I'm uh, yet to be convinced that they can make them resonate. Do you, when you hark back to your past days, do you see your childhood as a troubled one or did it just help you grow as a person and as a designer? Uh, I think all our childhoods help us grow, Atish. Uh, you know, it, it, what doesn't uh, what doesn't kill you and uh, let you get slightly older is uh, is a good thing. So uh, I'm a big believer in resilience, and uh, and I think it's in that resilience that we also find a resonance. And the more troubles you've had, the more you can empathize with uh, with other things, other people, and other situations. So. I tried my very best to uh, be cruel to my children, to beat them, to give them no self-esteem, hoping that, uh, you know, they would grow into well-rounded individuals. And what are your children doing at the moment? Sorry, one of them's in a psych ward and the other, no, uh, they're both remarkably well. Uh, my daughter uh, does podcasting and uh, uh, helps run theater companies, uh, small theater companies applying for grants, etc. Uh, and also working at the moment with Medicine Sans Frontieres uh, on projects uh, here and in Bangladesh for, uh, for so I'm depending on her karma to uh, help me survive into the next incarnation because I've made such terrible films sometimes that uh, perhaps I'll be back as a cockroach otherwise. You know, all those gas guzzlers and all those high-end props you made for Mad Max Fury Road, it ultimately led to that Oscar-winning moment. Do these awards mean something to you? Uh, look, you'd be silly to say they don't. I used to joke uh, when people said, where is your award? And I said it was uh, holding the back door open so the dog could take a piss. But uh, in actual fact, it is always, it is always, you know, a, a great thing to be recognized and to be thanked. And uh, I have to tell you a secret. For me, the most beautiful thing about it was being able to take my wife. And uh, I think she enjoyed it more than I did. And uh, maybe she had more to be thankful for than, than I did. Uh, yes, it's great to uh, it, that people still think and still, uh, and still do accept uh, that there was work done. But obviously you've seen enough films and spoken to enough designers to know that what we are really in is the business of collaboration. I am the call in collaborate. And uh, there are so many people. It if you knew how many people it made to, to make me look even vaguely uh, good at what I'm doing, you'd be very upset and you'd probably stop the conversation. There are a host. You know, when you're making all these props and... Uh all these gas guzzlers for the film. How long did it take? And what was the brief given to you by Miller? Well, the, the storyboards that I first saw, the, there were probably over, I don't know, 1,200, 1,500 storyboards in that room. And of course, 95% of them were just small. You know, here is something that looks like a car and two guys on top. Uh, and so the brief was within some of those characters and within George's understanding and imagination, there were certain things he wanted to get across. And if you take those keys uh, and then develop them using our other set of rules and philosophies, our new aesthetic, then uh, you're, you're basically hopefully pushed in the right direction. They had done, because one of the guys working with George, Brendan McCarthy, was a fabulous uh, cartoonist and artist. And uh, he had done some terrific uh, concept work. But for me, they weren't concepts for Fury Road as a film. They, they, they were too fantastical. They were too uh, 
too beautiful and uh, they didn't follow the rules of the world. If you needed, basically, if you needed 14 semi-trailers and all the fuel it would take to drag a 747 through a sand dune to, uh, to make a point, it's a great image, but it's not a plausible world. And, uh, and that's not how you use your very, very finite resources. So we took the we took the the bravado and the and the love and the heart that was in those concepts, and then tried to uh, tried to make it real. Every single film that you've been a part of, whether it is Adventures of Priscilla, Mad Max Universe, or your upcoming film Furiosa, is known for its flamboyant aesthetics. What's your design process to capture the essence of the characters and their journey that they undertake in the film? Well, usually it just depends on you being lucky enough for that to be already in the script. And then you just try to tease it out. I mean, I, I figure that we're really just putting flesh. And as long as the bones are either not too disfigured or are completely disfigured, which is equally as gorgeous, then uh, we're putting flesh onto that so that people are feeling a reality and therefore a connection to those things. And so... Uh, um, I don't know that flamboyant is what I am. As you may have noticed, loud is probably one of them, uh, a little abrasive, possibly very annoying. Uh, but we try to to tailor all of that to uh, to an experience for the audience that makes that makes better, more real and uh, and more resonant the story that we have before us. And the next big thing in your life is Furiosa, I believe, at for the moment. And with the upcoming... Uh, yes. And I assume you, you're shooting it at the moment? You, no, you're done Furiosa, it, it's, it's we... It's more post-production work going on. Yeah, we've finished We've finished shooting. There are there are the odd, uh, the odd pickup. But uh, no, we've finished shooting and George is, uh, is deep in the editing process uh, now and it's uh, due out in May. So how did you tackle the challenge of expanding the Mad Max universe while maintaining the sense of the original film? If you can provide any insight into the design element that will distinguish this particular film from other films you have done in the past. Well, this one, even just compared to Fury Road, this is a prequel. This is basically, we we were part of, I think, the wonderment that... Uh, that gave us Charlize Theron's Furiosa. Uh, and uh, she, was, she was such an epic and wonderful character that uh, really the next story had to be, how did she become in amongst this dystopia? How did, how did why, why was mankind clever enough to have invented a Charlize Theron at this point? Um, and uh, and I think uh, so. This one is is more oriented to her backstory and to her growth. So it was whereas Fury Road was three or four days of uh, incredible mayhem in one in one in one movie. Uh, this is uh, this tracks decades of a girl of a girl becoming a woman becoming a warrior. And if you can uh, provide so, some insight on the design elements. So on the design elements, therefore. We had already rung fairly hard the uh, the the vehicle uh, section of where we were, uh, but we had also hinted at other places in Fury Road, at Gastown, at Bullet Farm, at the Green Place from whence the R, uh, whence Charlie's was ha had come originally, and so we had these three new areas to flesh out. And we had a whole world to put in between them. So it was a fairly conscious decision that the other pivot, the new, uh, the new and additional nemesis or counterpoint in the drama uh, to be played by Chris Hemsworth uh, would be basically following the, uh, the Mongol horde version of, uh, of the world. So whereas the Immorton controlled the world by faux feudalism and uh, fake religion, and uh, you'll all go to heaven if you follow me. Uh, this was more the, this was more the uh, the Genghis Khan theory of of uh, follow me, I can plan, I can provide, you'll survive longer and better. 
And so it was the supply of uh, oils and spoils that gave us the clue. Uh, and therefore, this one is more, uh, to a large degree, motorbike uh, and smaller engine objects uh, than the first. So that obviously takes you down a whole other line of attack. You know, being a journalist and being a thespian, it's my duty to have mastery in words. But I am amazed to meet someone who is better than me. How does it? How does it feel? If do you use social media? Do you do you follow Twitter? Do you tweet something? Do you write? Uh, I write, but uh, only for myself. The same bad poetry that uh, that we all do when we're thirteen in our rooms and no one's watching. Just give me a second. Yes. So, so uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't uh, tend to follow any of the uh, any of the Twitterati, X, Facebook, or uh, or anything very much. But uh, I think soon, uh, if uh, Chat GPT does take over the world, and uh, we are not required for film and television and uh, graphic art, then. Uh, Maybe I'm just practicing speaking so that I can. Uh, Would I can, you take up the director's hat tour. as well? Oh, more than happy to do so. Let me know if you have a script. <laughs> oh, I do have. I have tons of scripts in my mind over here. You have to come to <laughs> India for that. Oh, well, I'll come back. I haven't been to the north. The last time I was there, I was with, uh, with uh, an Australian Indian guy who had a film he wanted to shoot in Calcutta. Um, but uh, very little came of it unfortunately, although I did get to meet some very nice producers and actors while I was there. So uh, now I would be more than excited to come back to India. I was in China after Fury Road doing uh, The Great Wall uh, with uh, Zhang Yimou and uh, you guys in India have uh, as many fascinating and interesting directors working now. And uh, it would be it would be great to be re-energized by uh, by your country and culture sometime soon. So uh, it'll be wonderful to host you again. I'm available. So what does Colin Gibson do when he's not on the sets? Uh, What's the typical day in Colin you, Gibson's I'm, life? My wife will tell you I'm always on the sets um, or at home driving her crazy, not being able to rest or stop. Uh, so uh, no, we've, uh, I, I just, I like to uh, to build to uh, to read, I probably read more than I paint or draw or anything. I'm probably the worst artist of all the production designers you've uh, interviewed and probably all of the people who build tiny houses, which was the other reason I thought Home Crux was talking to me because uh, I'm quite small and uh, and I've just finished building a tiny house for a show. And uh, and I've noticed that you've had quite a number of them uh, on Home Crux. Well, we've, we've uh, tiny houses is our main photo actually. We've been covering it for the past 10, 15 years, and have interviewed some Australian-based makers, US-based makers, and uh, uh, New Zealand-based makers. How's the tiny house movement in Australia? Do 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 you have ever lived inside a home? Ah, uh, yeah. No, we 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 uh we have a tendency. We call them dongers here, which is not a very attractive name. But uh, many, many times when you when we're working in the desert or in mining camps or whatever, uh, small objects about the size of a 20-foot shipping container are dropped off and uh, everybody dresses and caters and fixes them to their own specifications. And, uh, and so in a way, we have our own history of tiny houses, uh, albeit uh, you go outside uh, to a blute. All right. Did you watch sports for fun? Do you watch cricket, football, tennis? Uh, I'm probably going to be in trouble for saying this to uh, to an Indian, but uh, I, I loathe cricket. Uh, I was my son and my daughter's cricket coach and ran their teams, but hated every moment of it and uh, just never liked cricket. So I do. I watch uh, soccer, uh, football, as we call it. Uh, but uh, that's really about the only sport that I follow. Uh, except, you know, when I'm working. So if you're in China, you you follow Chinese sports and you take up smoking. And uh, if you're in America, you, in, in uh, America, you care about baseball for the brief moments you're there. And if you're in South Africa, you just try to have a good time and not annoy anyone. 
All right, Colin Gibson, it was really wonderful having a conversation with you. And I have thoroughly cherished and thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I've not been at the very best uh, when it comes to words and when it comes to poetry and all that stuff. And even the questions, because uh, I initially thought of taking this interview from a studio. But then since it is 7.30 in the morning, I studio is not that accessible to me. But it was really great and wonderful having to wonderful hosting you home at home, Crux. Lovely to have spoken to you and uh, bye for now. Bye bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. I can hear you, but I can't see you. You cannot see. see. No, did you close your eyes? No, no, I didn't close my eyes. I'm able to see you all right. <laughs> Speaking, I was not expecting to see you because I thought it, you're like three minutes late. I am not sure if I'm uh, sure or not. I know I have, I have a habit of being just always late. Someone catches me and so I was scrambling to find the link and get set up, so. On the upper room is too noisy. Hang on, let me just turn that light off. One second. That's better. Yeah, it's better now. So, how's the day going? It's afternoon here in India. How's the uh, weather in England at the moment? It's raining. <laughs> it's raining? Yeah, yeah. All right, then. I'm just give you a brief introduction of who I am and what I do. I am, okay. you can just adjust the camera and whenever you want me to start, I can begin. <laughs>